So Brandy's been a master gardener. I don't know, Brandy, how many years now? <laughs> um, seven years since 2012. Seven. Great. So Brandy's kind of our in-house Dahlia guru now. She's been growing them for several years now for cut flowers. And as I said earlier, we had Brandy do a program um, in the spring about growing dahlias. So we wanted to follow up with what do you do with the dahlias now that you've grown them and it's time to put them away for winter. So Brandy, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm going to uh, mute myself. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so some of you, or most of you, tried growing dahlias this year and they're actually pretty easy to grow. The most questions that we receive are, well, what do I do with them for the winter? How do I store them? How do I divide them? And I'm gonna start by saying that there are multiple methods. There's no one, you know, right way. And if you were to ask, I read an article yesterday that said, if you were to ask 10 gardeners who grow dahlias, their method for overwintering, you would probably get 10 different answers. <laughs> so it really depends on, you know, the quantity of plants that you're growing. Um, what are you growing them for? You know, are you just growing them in your landscape beds? Are you growing them for the show table? You know, or do you actually show them in competitions? Are you growing them for cut flower production? That, and that all plays into kind of what methods you're gonna use going forward. So, let me see if I can get this to work. So dahlias continue to flower up until the frost. And one of the most important things that you want to do before it frosts is label your plants. So this morning I was in the garden frantically running around trying to get the last of my plants labeled because it looks like tomorrow night we're gonna have um, a killing frost, um, which I'm a little bit thankful for. So there are, if once your plants are dead, unless you have a map, um, you know, you might be able to know, okay, I only have a few, I know this one is this one. I grow them in rows and I mix all different varieties together. So for me, it's really important to get out there and label them. And after a killing frost, you want to, leave the plants, leave the clumps in the ground for one to two weeks. After the dahlia plants feel that cold, it signals to the tubers, okay, we are ready to go into dormancy. And their skins become a little bit thicker. Um, they kind of save up their energy to go through the winter. You can dig them earlier, like say we get a killing frost and then it's gonna be super, super cold and the ground might freeze you would want to lift them and get them out. Um, but they say that the odds of winter storage of the uncured tubers is, is less. You're going to get more that, that don't make it uh, through the winter. So the past couple of years, we've had this problem where we don't get a killing frost until November. And um, sometimes you don't want to be out there in the snow, in the sleet, digging up these tubers in the mud when it's freezing cold. So you can kind of trick them into going dormant. Um, so say it gets to be, you know, the last week of October, you're ready to, to be done and put the garden to bed. What you can do is you can cut down the plants. Um, some people, some people don't recommend this because they say when you cut the plants down, the tuber stems are, are hollow. And if we get a lot of rain, water can build up in the stems and cause crown rot. So that's why I have the optional uh, cover the stems. I think it just depends on your, your growing purpose. So I have had years where I've gone through and I've topped the plants. Uh, when you top them, either if they're killed by a killing frost or if you're cutting them down before they've died, you want to leave six to eight inches of the stem as a handle. And you'll see when you're cutting them down that those stems will be full of water. So I think that they already have a little bit of water in there. 
Um, if you're growing them for show and you really don't want to risk getting crown rot in, in the clump, then you can go ahead and cover the top of the stems with like aluminum foil or plastic wrap and a rubber band um, or put a little container over it just to protect that. But it's a 50-50. Some growers say, nah, don't bother. I've done it and I've left the stems exposed and they've been fine. But either way, you want to leave the clumps in the ground for one to two weeks to let them kind of cure and toughen up. Uh, so that's the first step. Then you have to dig them up. And that's probably my least favorite part because I have uh, clay like soil and it just is like a muddy mess and the, the clumps are stuck in the ground and you do have to be very careful not to damage the clumps when you're lifting them out of the soil. So you want to make sure you give enough room around the base of the plant. It's about a foot around the stem. So go wide and then try to go deep underneath and lift, lift those clumps out of the ground. Try not to, I do it and it, it, it happens, you try not to pull the plant out of the ground by the stem because it might break off and then you're, it just makes a bigger mess. You want to try to get your shovel or your fork fully underneath the clump and then kind of just hold the stem to brace it and pop it, pop it up out of the ground. Um, it really just depends on your soil type, how much of a struggle that's going to be. Um, for me, I, I struggle with it because of the type of soil that I have. So you're going to break some tuber tubers off digging them out and that's okay. You should have enough left to propagate. So after you get the tuber lifted out, you want to kind of tap off or brush off um, the excess soil. In my case, it's usually mud. And you want to also maybe tip the clump upside down and get any of that water that is in the stem, kind of get that out of there so um, it doesn't stay collected in the stem. And then you wanna take your clumps and you wanna put them in a sheltered place, uh, somewhere that's not gonna freeze, you don't want them to freeze, just so that the, the clumps can dry for a couple days. I find it's like, you know, two, two to three days. You don't want them, to, you don't want them to dry out, um, but you don't want them to be kind of wet when you put them away. So washing the clumps is another, question that people run into and you get both answers, yes and no. Some people say, no, I don't wash my clumps off. I like to leave the dirt on. It adds like another layer of protection. Um, some people say, yes, wash the dirt off. It has microorganisms. You don't want it on your tubers. Um, you want to clean, wash them off. I think it depends on what type of soil you have and how are you storing your clumps? Um, I have clay-like soil, so in order to even see the clumps, I have to wash the soil off. So I have to set up a spray zone and get out the hose and put it on jet and spray off my soil to even see the clumps um, before I put them in my garage. This is my little uh, garage photo here. And if you have a nice loamy soil where you can just brush it off and, and you can, you know, this, this photo isn't that bad, like you can leave that amount of soil on, it's not going to hurt it. Um, it would dry as you, as you let them dry. The second option is, well, how are you storing these clumps? If you're storing the clumps whole over the winter, I would say, yeah, you can, you can leave the soil on, take off any excess. Um, or you could wash them. I think it's just a personal, a personal preference and I would try it. I would experiment and see what works for you. You also wanna be on the lookout for leafy gall. Um, this is a tuber clump from my garden. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. So leafy gall is a bacteria that gets into uh, the stem and the base of the plant and what it does is it, it mutates and infects the plant and it makes the plant think that it wants to send out multiple weak little stems. I already have a plant this year that I saw when I was tagging that looks like it's going to have leafy gall when I pull it up because it's got a ton of little shoots and like sprouts. 
So any tubers that are any clumps that show signs of this leafy gall, throw them away, throw them in the trash. Um, you don't want to propagate from them because they probably are infected. The tubers are infected and they're just going to regrow with that leafy gall. They're not going to be healthy plants. And then if you do come across uh, a clump like this, I would have a bucket of bleach water ready. Uh, so 10 parts of water to one part bleach. And I would dip your shovel or your digging fork in it just to sanitize it before you go on to the next clump so you're not spreading it. The research that I have found shows that it, leafy gall does not over, it rarely overwinters in the soil without plant medium to live on. So if you find it, you know, um, and you dig it out and you throw it away, you should be okay. It shouldn't uh, survive in the soil, but it can survive, you know, you can transfer it on your tools. So you want to sterilize your tools. And then the question is, do I divide in the fall or do I divide in the spring? And that is a personal choice. I think it's also a choice that you make based on your storage location. So dividing in the fall, the tubers take up way less space in storage. Um, and I think it also depends on time. Are you busy in the fall or are you busy in the spring? When do you have time to divide these tubers? But in the fall, the tubers take up way less space when they're divided down individually, but the eyes are a little bit harder to see. They do say that letting those tubers get a killing, you know, letting the plants get in killing frost and leaving those clumps in the ground for two weeks, they say makes the eyes pop, but not in the way that they pop in the spring. They'll be more nubs than they will actual sprouts. So dividing in the fall is not the best for new growers, um, it, unless you have a lot of clumps to kind of experiment and practice and you're willing to take that risk of, of losing some, some tubers. Dividing in the spring, the eyes are more visible. They'll actually be bumped out and um, a lot of times they're like deep purple so you can see them. So it makes the clumps easier to divide with confidence. However, the clumps take up more storage space in, as a whole. So that's just a personal choice you have to work through. The storage location, the ideal requirements for dahlia tubers are 38 degrees to 45 degrees, 75 to 85% relative humidity and darkness. That is the ideal solution storage space for them. Um, most people don't have that. <laughs> we don't want our basements at 75% humidity. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of modern basements are really warm. They get up to 60, 65 degrees. So this is where you need to take a look and see where am I going to keep these, these tubers. If they freeze, they're going to turn to mush and be disgusting and you're not going to be able to use them. If they get too warm, they're going to they're not gonna stay dormant, they're gonna rot and they'll get gross. If it's too dry, they're gonna shrivel up and get all you know, hard and shriveled. If it's too humid, they're gonna get moldy and rotted. They like it just right. So this is where you have to figure out where in your home or your garage, if it's heated and insulated or where you're gonna keep these things. Picking your storage container and your medium, you can base that off of where are you going to keep them. So for me, my basement is a walkout basement and the hallway to where the walkout door is, is one of the coldest parts. So I have a little hallway that I can put up a curtain. So I put up a curtain that blocks it from the rest of the basement and it tends to stay around 50 to 55 degrees. So that is where I keep my tubers, under a workbench where it's kind of dark. There's a window there, I try to block off the light. The other problem is that it, our basement is dry. We run a dehumidifier. Um, we don't want high humidity in our basement. So my tubers tend to store better, individually divided and uh, kept in plastic bags. So, if I store them in whole clumps, which I did last year in lawn leaf bags, they, they get really dry, they do dry out. 
So for storage containers, you can use cardboard boxes, the lawn uh, leaf paper bags from like Value or Home Depot, those work really well. They're tall, they hold a lot of clumps, uh, plastic crates, plastic totes. If you have a drier environment that you're storing the tubers, you might wanna go with a plastic tote that's gonna kind of hold in more of the moisture so that it doesn't get dried out. If you have a really humid um, cellar that's damp, you might wanna go with the paper or the cardboard that breathes a little bit more. Um, your storage medium, you can use anything from wood shavings, a lot of people recommend peat moss, but that's a one that goes back and forth. Some growers say, no, absolutely not. It sucks too much moisture out. You have to pre-moisten it. Some people say it works great. Vermiculite is another one that people use or they'll use a vermiculite and peat moss mix. Um, vermiculite, I feel like it's expensive. You have to get the bigger particle size because it's dangerous to breathe. Um, some people go as far to wrap the, the individual tubers in plastic wrap. A lot of people like in the, um, in the upper like Midwest, like in Colorado, it's so dry in the winter, they will wrap each tuber in plastic wrap and then put them in like a styrofoam cooler or cooler and store them that way to kind of retain the moisture. Um, I've used paper, shredded paper before. So I think it just depends on what you wanna experiment with, what you wanna invest in, I personally like to use the premium wood shavings. Um, last year I bought a cheap bag and it was way too dusty and it really, it's, it's a pain when you have to breathe in all that dust. Um, again, it depends on if you divided them, like I do prefer to divide my tubers in the fall and then I put them in plastic Ziploc bags layered with shavings and I leave the bags open. So they're not completely sealed, um, but I also have stored clumps layered in lawn bags. So you open your lawn bag, do a layer of shavings or peat moss, put in the clumps, do another layer of shavings, another clumps, you know, and just build it up until it's full. And that does work pretty good. So you just kind of have to decide, maybe you're gonna try two methods. Maybe you're gonna try some in a plastic tote and some in a lawn bag and see what works for you. And throughout the winter, you wanna go down and inspect the tubers um, at least a couple times every, you know, every few weeks if you're really into it. I usually pull them out um, January, February to see how they're doing. If, if there's any that are showing signs of rot, throw them away. They're like apples when they start rotting, the gases that come off, you know, from the rotting material will infect the other tubers. So um, you want to get any tubers that are rotting out of there because they'll ruin the whole batch. And then you might find some that are starting to shrivel or looking kind of dried out. You might want to mist those with a water bottle to give them a little bit more moisture. Um, like for me, when they're divided individually in the plastic bags, I'll go through the bags and if they start to look, uh, you know, harder or shriveler, shrivelly, I'll um, close up the bag so that the moisture is contained in the bag for the rest of the season. Um, a little bit of mold, you might see a little bit of like blue mold or white mold on the tuber itself. That's normal. It's not going to hurt it. It just means that where you're storing them is damp. Um, it is it is a little wet, so you might just want to move them to a drier location, brush off the mold and move them to a drier location. Also keep in mind that some dahlia varieties, they just do not store well. They're poor tuber producers, like you'll dig up, you'll dig up a clump and it'll be just like massive and huge and be like, oh, this one produced so many. Then you'll dig up another variety and it'll have made like four tubers and sometimes they're scrawny and skinny and it it's not always your fault. Sometimes the varieties just are not good producers. So let's go over a little bit of clump anatomy before we get into um, dividing or actually Jan did you want to um, did you want to do any questions about storage before we go on to dividing? Yeah, we could do that. Nobody's put anything in the chat, but if um, somebody has a specific question, 
go ahead. You can either raise your hand and I can unmute you or, you know, we can take a couple questions. Why don't we see if there's two or three? Because I'm sure if one person has a question. Anybody yeah, have any, questions specific to storage? Yeah, any specific storage questions? People have kept them. I do, I do oh. Jan. Yes, Lucy. Uh, could you hear me? Be, can you hear me? Uh, we've got Lucy. Garage? I think we've got two people. So Lucy, why no. don't you go first? Okay. Would a garage be too cold? Uh, you know what, Lucy, if it's not heated, um, or I would say yes. Um, okay. uh, my garage is insulated. Um, it, you know, it's finished, but it does get below free, like it does get below freezing. I would not store them in my garage. I wouldn't take the risk. But however, I know people that have used old refrigerators in their garages and just set, you know, the refrigerator temperature to 45 degrees and have stored um, the tubers in the refrigerator. Um, yeah. You just have to take the risk of, of checking them and make sure it doesn't get on the fritz and freeze them or, or it shuts off and then it gets way too warm in there. But um, it would, I think in our area, it could be risky in a, in a garage. Thank you. Okay. Connie, Connie Moon, did you have a question? Yes, um, she did answer. I was thinking about the garage, but um, I I could put them in my basement. I, unfortunately, I already pulled some up. I didn't realize I had to wait, but that's all right. That's I got, okay. I still they have, might make I still it. have some growing. But um, the problem is we go away for a couple of months in the winter. So I can I put them in plastic bags and put a little water in them and then close them? And my basement is not real cold, but it's it's probably maybe 50. I wouldn't I wouldn't add any water. I would just pack them in um, Ziploc bags, or um, you know, if if you're not going to divide them, are you going to divide them or, or leave them as clumps? I, I could divide them now. It doesn't make any difference. So I would I would divide them and then and then put them in plastic bags with wood shavings, and I would leave the bags open. Just make sure there's a layer of shavings on top. Um, and then check them when you get back and see if they okay. need, if they're looking dry, then seal them up until, you know, until you're ready to plant. Do you think I should, cause we're gone for a couple months. Should I spray them before I leave and then? I, I don't think I, I don't think I would. If they're nice and plump and firm when you pack them away, um, you know, again, it depends on the variety, but I wouldn't add any, you want them to be dry and, and put away dry. And then when, I would check them when you get back and see how, if they're looking shrivelly when you get back, mist them, you know, mist them okay. and, and let them sit and absorb, absorb that yeah. moisture. But I wouldn't mist them before you go because that you might ha end up triggering them to rot. You know, I did have some one year and they did rot and I didn't know what was wrong, but now I know. Okay, <laughs> thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, let's let's go on then, Brandy. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, some clump anatomy, and um, when you dig out your clump, so people often refer to the crown, the crown of of the tuber, the crown of the clump, and that is the area below the stem where the tubers come off of. The tubers come out of the crown. The crown is what houses the eyes. And in order for a tuber to be viable, it has to have an eye. And then the neck is where the tuber connects to the crown. And then this part, the bulbous part, you know, right here is usually called either the tuber or the body. Um, this part is usually called the tail. So all of these terms, uh, neck, if the neck is broken, a lot of times the tuber will not survive. Um, the tuber has to have a viable eye, um, which is part of the crown. So you'll get familiar with all of these um, terms as you read more up on how to divide. Also, most all of the photos after this, um, that crown picture and these, 
These are all taken from Summer Dreams Farm. I did not take them. The gentleman, Michael, he is a young farmer in Michigan and he grows several acres of dahlias. His website is beautiful. He's, he grows over 200 varieties and he does sell his tubers. Um, he has a beautiful uh, page on how to divide. He took pictures step by step and that's where I took these pictures from. So his um, website is on my reference sheet. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. And I do not want to claim these photos as my own. These are, these are Michael's from Summer Dreams Farm in Michigan. Um, so this is a really great uh, photo that where he color coded the parts of the tuber. And so I think, I think that's where a lot of people get confused. They're just, they cannot comprehend, well, what is that crown? Like, what is that? So this pink part is the crown. That is the part that's underneath you know, the base of the, the stem where the eyes are, the purple is the neck, and then the green is the body or the actual, you know, tuber. And then this part is where the food, um, you know, source is held. This is where it saves its energy to make it through the winter and re-sprout the following year. Okay, so these are the basic steps of dividing your tuber, your dahlia clumps. You're gonna, you're, you dug it up, you let it dry for a few days, maybe you overwintered it, you're doing it in the spring. You're gonna remove any broken tubers. Um, you know, you'll clearly see that they're snapped off at the neck, you know, trim them off. You can trim off the root hairs now or you can do it after. You're gonna also see what's called the mother tuber. So that is the tuber that you planted in the spring and what formed your plant and produced these little new tubers, don't keep her. Um, there's been a lot of research that shows that she just will rot and the odds of it producing a plant the following year, I don't know if it's quite at 50%. So a lot of times it'll be dried out already. So the mother tuber you don't keep, you can get rid of. Also, any tubers that are coming off of a tuber. I should have had a picture of this. So you'll like see a tuber, you'll see a tuber and then it might have like another neck and a tuber coming off like down here. You can cut those off. They will not be viable. They will not produce a plant. The easiest way is to cut the clump in half. You're, you might lose a couple tubers, it's okay. You have to start to break down the clump in order to divide them individually. So just, just find the best spot of where you can cut and cut the clump in half. Then you take the half and you cut that in half or you start to see where you can make your cuts, but you need to keep some of the crown attached to the tuber because that's where the eyes are housed. And then you just keep splitting the clump until it's divided into single tubers. And you're gonna choose strong, firm tubers. Uh, check out the necks and make sure that they're not broken. And then toss any ones that are, are weak or damaged or kind of look mushy. And then you're gonna to wanna to clean your tools before you go on to another clump. Dahlia viruses, um, are really, really high and you just want to stop the spread of that. And if you sterilize your clippers or your knives in between uh, with a 10 parts water, one part bleach solution, it stops the spread of dahlia viruses. And then that's it, you're done. <laughs> so no, it's not that easy. So let's break it down even further. Okay, so here's the clump again. So these green lines show you this is the crown. So this is where we want to take a look at the tuber and we want to decide, okay, maybe we cut it in half, like right across here. You just have to kind of, it's kind of like a puzzle. You just have to look at it and, and decide, okay, where am I going to make that first cut? So he is going to split it right in half. He's got some pretty big garden shears. I just use um, bypass pruners most of the time, like an old crappy pair, especially because I'm dipping them in the bleach water in between. And so you just go ahead and cut the tuber in half. 
or the clump, I'm sorry, the clump in half. So then he has half of the clump that he just split and he's gonna divide that in half again. And so this part here is the part that we need to make sure we keep attached to the tuber because that's where our eye and some clumps are easier to divide than others. Some like this one, the tubers are nice and spread out, but then you'll dig some up that are just gnarly and the tubers are just intertwined with each other and you're, you're gonna break some and it's fine, it will be okay. So this is a close up of the previous picture and you can kind of see like this little bump right here and like right here, those are where the eyes would be. Um, they definitely are more prominent in the spring. They, they might actually be like the darker purple color. So it just takes practice. It just takes getting to know the, the tuber clumps and what they look like, what you're looking for. Um, getting to, to know that ridge right there, that's the part that you need to keep attached to the tuber. So he cut this in half again. And then that from that half, he cut it in half again. So I don't know if you can really see, like that might be an eye right there. But this right here is clearly where the neck starts and this part right here is all crown. So then you want to try to, once you get it down to a single tuber, you'll see that there's some stem material kind of, you know, still attached to the crown. If you don't feel comfortable kind of turning it off, you can leave it on, but the, we try to take off as much stem as possible because it is, um, it's a common source of rot. Uh, so if you leave a bunch of the stem portion attached to the crown, it can lead to rot. So he has a different angle here that kind of shows you. So this, this dried out part here is like the top, it's underneath the base of the stem um, and it gets dried out and weird. So he's just trimming that off. But then you can still see like this is the start of the neck and this part here is crown. Um, I believe on his website, he says you really only need like half the size of a dime of the crown um, and you should be guaranteed an eye. Sometimes I've done it and I'm, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing such a good job. And then in the spring I pull them out and I was like, what were you thinking? Like you hacked these, there's not even an eye on here. <laughs> but you get the hang of it. Once you do a bunch, you, you become familiar with the material. So then that was it. He divided that entire clump and he got eight tubers out of it. And he put the battery in just as a reference. So you can kind of see like this one, sometimes you'll get, you'll get like, okay, maybe the size of this one isn't big enough. Um, it, it might not survive the winter. So like you might have two that you leave attached um, that you don't wanna risk separating. There might not be enough crown space there. So there might be a couple that you leave two tubers intact to the crown. Um, and then you can trim off any root hairs and stuff like that to clean them up. Some people uh, dip the tubers then after they're divided in a sulfur uh, vermiculite powder just to ward off, you know, bacteria and mold over the winter. I don't, I, I've dipped mine one year, I dipped them. Some people also dip them in a bleach water solution uh, to kill any fungus. I stopped doing that. I just divide them and then you should really let your cuts dry. Um, after you divide them, you should let the cuts dry for at least a couple days uh, before you package them up. Uh, last year, I didn't do that either. I just cut them and pack packaged them up. I think it's just about the risk that you're willing to take. If you only have a few, if you only have a few clumps, I would be really diligent about letting them dry after you cut them. If you have a bunch, like I have over a hundred clumps to divide, I'm going to have a, a I'm okay losing a couple, like it's, it's not gonna bother me. So it just depends. So some final tips. Um, if you, 
if you have an ideal storage spot, so say you do have a spot that stays, you know, around 40 degrees, 38 degrees, you might actually have to wake your tubers up in the spring, even, even, even if they're clumps, you know, even if they're clumps or they're already divided, if you have a really, a really cool spot, you might have to signal to them like, especially if you want to divide them, if you kept them as clumps and you want to divide them and see those eyes, I would move them into a warmer location, not super warm, not, you know, 75 degrees, but move them into a warmer, you know, 55, 65 degree location um, where they can wake up and the eyes will start to pop more. You'll see those um, about a month before you want to either divide or if you've already divided them, uh, plant. And then if you're feeling really intimidating by dividing, like you just, you don't want to mess it up, just try, you know, um, in the spring or even this fall, just try cutting the clumps in half um, and storing them as halves and then planting them as halves, even, even quarters, you know, cut them in half and then quarter them. And it, it for me, it's a bigger pain to plant it, a half a tuber clump. It, you got to dig a bigger hole. Um, so I really do like to get them down into the individual tubers, but if you are divided by it, it is okay to just divide the clump in half and plant half that clump in the spring. It will be fine. And then you want to experiment and try multiple methods. If you do have some varieties that you really don't want to risk losing, maybe separate them. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Try storing a couple here, storing one here. I'm going to store it over here in a plastic tote. I'm going to store over here in a, in a paper bag. Um, and then make observations and take notes. And it will get easier. I know it sounds like really daunting and a total pain, but once you come up with your routine and your method of what works for you, it will be much more enjoyable. And um, usually I am grumbling in November, like, ah, I'm never gonna, I'm not done. I'm not planting dahlias anymore. But come spring, you're like, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to get those. And especially too, when you pull them out and they're sprouting and you're like, yes, I'm gonna get them in the ground. They're gonna be beautiful. So it is a labor of love and you just have to find uh, what works for you. So do we have any questions on dividing? Do we need to We actually back? have quite a few questions back in the chat. So why don't I go over those for first summer on storage? Okay. Do you have any tips on um, storing dahlias in pots or containers over the winter? So I have done this before. Um, I did it with just, um, you know, a dahlia, the dahlias that you can get from the garden center, like the bedding dahlias. So I would assume that you can do it with other types. Um, I also do it with my begonias. You just, you would let the plant get frosted, but don't let the pot freeze outside um, or just cut back the plant. So leave like a couple inches of stem. And then you would want to put the pot in a ideal storage location, like a basement that stays about 50 degrees or 40 degrees would be better. And just let it dry out. I would just let it dry out. I wouldn't water it. I would just leave it. And then in the spring, you know, move it, move it outside and start to water it. Um, I've had them come back in a pot that way. Great. So but Julie you would has a very- want to divide it. You, 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 know, you might get away with one season of letting it regrow in the pot, but you probably would want to take it out of the pot in the spring and, and divide it because it's going to get tuber bound. Gotcha. So Julie has a very damp basement and has wrapped tubers in newspaper or she's going to, what are your thoughts? If you, if you have a really damp basement, I would try, I would try storing them in a plastic tote with um, wood chips or peat moss, um, probably peat you know, probably peat moss if it's, or like, um, or a lawn bag. So you have the lawn bag has the multiple layers of paper. So it is breathable, but then maybe you use peat moss as your storage medium because that's gonna um, help regulate the moisture. With a really damp environment, it's like you, you either wanna trap out the moisture. So you either wanna put them in a plastic tote 
and maybe use wood chips. Um, you could try maybe half wood chips, half saran wrapped. Um, if you're gonna do individual tubers, if you're gonna do clumps, I would do maybe half wood chips. Um, you could try wrapping the clumps in newspaper to give them you know, a little bit more uh, layer of breathability. But I think either that or you have to do a breathable, like a cardboard or cardboard box lined with newspaper. And then peat, I would do peat moss if you're in a really damp uh, basement. All right, could you kind of go over again? How do you recognize the mother tuber? Oh, sure. Let me see if I can. You'll know because it looks completely different than the other tubers. I think he has it. I think it's this one right here. It's usually bigger. It's usually a bigger shape and it's usually really dark brown like it'll be darker the skin color will be darker than than the new the new growth tubers um and it'll be like woodier the texture will be woodier um i don't know for for certain if i think that is the mother tuber right there on this his clumps are very clean <laughs> on this one <laughs> <laughs> he, he sprayed them so nicely <laughs> Um, I don't think I have a close up. It's hard to tell on this one. It's, it's like that one I think is the mother tuber. Like you'll be able to, you'll be able to tell. They're like gnarly looking. All right. So tagging them, how that do you one. tag them once they've been dug up so that you know who they are next spring? Ah, tag them. So I crawl around on the, on the, on the ground. I was crawling around on the ground this morning. I make a map. So I grow in two 50 foot rows. And if I was a big grower, like there are some growers around here that they grow um, thousands of, of dahlias. And so they will plant an entire row of just one variety. And then they label that row. And so as they dig out that row, then they'll put them in like crates and they'll label the crates. And so they they know. So it's easier when you have like a bigger quantity. I grow piecemeal. So I have two rows and I cram like, you know, just over probably like just under 150 dahlias in those two rows and they're all different varieties. So I make a map when I plant um, from east to west and I say, okay, I planted two blizzards. Okay, I planted three divas and they might not all make it. So now this time of year when they're blooming, I have to go back through and I use, it's called marking tape or surveyor's tape. It's this green, pink, blue. Um, you get it at the hardware store. I got mine at Tractor Supply. It's in with the levels. And I use Sharpie and I just write a uh, blizzard on it. And so then that's why I like to know, I like to do it when they're blooming so I can confirm this is truly this plant. I had some uh, this past week that are not blooming. So I'm just kind of like, question mark, maybe, maybe it's alloway candy. I'm not 100% sure. Um, some people label them in the spring with actual markers. It just depends on how many plants you have, um, what your style of growing them is. Mine is, mine is so mixed that um, this is the system that works best for me. Some people use like the little tree flags. And so when they plant the tuber, they'll stick in the little, they'll write on the tree flag with Sharpie. Um, and then I think the one girl puts it in the ground too. She'll like put the flag in the ground so that it's covered so it doesn't uh, fade away over the summer. So you just gotta find what works for you, but you definitely want them labeled before you dig them up because then you have no idea. So then after I divide them down, so when you keep them stored as the whole clumps, you, you can cut the stem down further. You can cut the stem to like two or three inches, but keep your tag wrapped around and then your whole clump will be labeled. After I divide mine, I put all the same variety in, in a bag. So I'll have a whole bag of a particular variety. Now I've even seen some, I mean, for growers, when they're shipping them, they write the name right on the tuber, right? Yes, um, a lot of, so um, some growers have stamps made and they'll try to stamp it. Um, there are, uh, there are, I think, special dahlia markers 
Um, if you Google, you know, if you Google it like Dahlia markers or you, you sh I can't remember what they're called. I've never invested the money in it. I've tried it with Sharpie before and it is really hard to write on the tuber. Um, for me, it was just easier to batch them in a bag and know that that entire bag is blizzard. Um, right. But they do make Dahlia markers. All right, so Dawn had another question. Um, her stems became too long this year and the weight of the flowers broke the flower off. She did have them staked. Any, I know you do quite a process with yours to keep um, them upright. I, especially if they're dinner plate, if they're the big, like the big dinner plate varieties, I would, I, did you pinch them? Like, did you pinch the plant when it had three sets of leaves? Did you cut the center stem out? That pinching the plant will give you stronger lateral branches that should be able to support. But sometimes um, with the dinner plate dahlias, they, they're just so big. The other solution might be, what did you fertilize with? Did you use like miracle Grow, or they do not like high nitrogen fertilizer. So maybe you, maybe you fertilized with something that had too much nitrogen in it. In it. Yeah, Dawn said she did not pinch and they were the dinner plate. Yeah, I would highly recommend next year when they get uh, three to four sets of leaves, pinch out that center stem and then you'll get stronger side branches, thicker side branches that should be able to support those flowers. I would still stake it though. Okay, so Jennifer joined a little late and um, we did sort of cover this, but maybe you just go over it quickly. Is it okay to store more than one tuber in each bag? Yes, um, so that's another, so as you read, um, do lots of reading. Uh, I provided, I think three or four resources um, that I personally like, um, but there are the Dahlia growing business is booming. So there are a lot of um, blogs and articles out there that you can find. And some people say, no, don't let the tubers touch each other, wrap them in newspaper. Um, you can let them touch each other. I would try to layer, you know, shavings or peat moss or something in between um, so that they're, they're not they should be okay. It's just that when one starts to rot, if it's touching another one, but really I think it's the gases that are released from a rotting tuber that signal uh, the other tubers to rot. So yes, you can store, um, you can store multiple clumps together, you know, on a layer, you can have them kind of like they can touch a little bit, but then on top, you got to put a layer on top so that they're not just stacked on top of each other. Um, you want to do a layer of, of medium, some clumps, a layer of medium, some clumps, but like next to each other, they can, they can touch, they'll be okay. All right, so I did put Brandy's um, references in the chat again, they should be um, viable links. And what I'm going to do is once we um, have the YouTube recording up, I will send out everybody who registered an email and we'll include Brandy's uh, references in the email. So are there any final questions? Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question? We'll take, you know, a couple of questions here if anybody has one that they want to want to ask. Brandy, I think this was great. Um, I learned a lot today, so. <laughs> and there's a ton, I mean, there's just a ton of information out there. And sometimes you'd be like, that is totally conflicting to what I just read. But it truly depends on what that, per how many plants that person is growing, where they're growing them, what are they growing them for? So you really have to hone in and try to find what works for you and, and why you're growing them. Um, I think Connie has another question. Yeah. Connie, do you have a question? Um, I was just thinking the clumps. Um, can I take small clumps and maybe put them in a plastic bag and put um, peat moss in there so they're not touching? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, you could do um, peat moss or wood shavings. Um, like if you don't want to buy uh, like a big bale of peat moss or a bale of, of wood shavings, like I you have can go. Some. Do you have some? Okay. Yeah, I have the some. The peat moss. 
the only thing with me, I don't really, my basement is so dry that I don't have success with the peat moss. If you have a really dry basement, you might want to get pre-moisten the peat moss a little bit, not sopping wet, but you might just want to yeah. get a little pre-moisture. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions for Brandy? I think we're good, Brandy. I don't see, I don't see any hands raised or, oh, wait a minute. Let me check the chat again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>